Hello, my name is Carolina Luneta, and I'm a lecturer of urban planning and gender at IHS Erasmus University. In this video, I will talk about the importance of stories for urban planning and storytelling as a co-creation tool. But first, let me begin with why stories matter. Stories give meaning to our lives. They tell us who we are, what we have done, where we come from. They help us talk about what is happening in our lives, our neighborhoods, and our city, and inform others about what matters to us. Stories are not only important to understand the past and the everyday experiences, but also allow us to imagine a desired future. Moreover, stories organize our knowledge around our values. These values, present in stories, express how we see and interpret the world, affecting the choices we make to act in cities. Both value and the future directness dimensions of stories are especially relevant for urban planning practice, as planning is an intentional and value-driven effort to improve the built environment. For Leonie Sandercock, an urban planning academic, planning is carried out through story, intentionally or not. Although some may believe that planning documents are just descriptive facts, in reality, plans and maps tell stories. Stories can be more descriptive or analytical, but the way the facts and data were collected, selected, and organized reflects a particular point of view and set of values used to draw conclusions for action. Stories are central to planning practice, to the knowledge it draws on, and to the knowledge it produces about the city. As Sander Koch notes, the way we narrate the city becomes constitutive of the urban reality, affecting the choices we make, the ways we then might act. But one can ask, can stories shape cities? Plans and planning processes prioritize some stories over others. Power differentials dominate the stories that circulate within planning process and city making. Felipe Moreira, an architect, urban planner, and storyteller from Brazil, explains how dominant culture and ideologies shape stories that operate in cities subjugating and excluding oppressed groups. From physical to symbolic dimensions, the production of territory in Brazilian cities prioritized the dominant stories. The stories of colonialism, patriarchism, and racism that structures Brazilian society are manifested in many ways in cities. In Sao Paulo, more than 50% of the population are women, and almost 40% are black. They have different backgrounds, religions, cultures, and of course, stories. But only a few are officially told. Let's look at São Paulo's monument, for instance. More than 80% of the public monuments honor white men. At least 15 honor men who have colonized, killed, raped, and enslaved black and native people. These monuments do not promote a critical reflection on the violent past of these subjects. On the contrary, they praise them as heroes who expanded and civilized the Brazilian territory. While white men are represented in their diversity, black women are represented by a single sculpture. This sculpture does not show her as a subject with a real name and a real story. Instead, it offers a common and violent scene that places black women as subaltern subjects. It shows a black woman forced to breastfeed a white child. Why did the Brazilian society choose to tell the single story of a black woman? Why not have sculptures of black women who fought against slavery or wrote books like Esperança Garcia or Lélia Gonzalez? There is a straight connection between the stories that we choose to tell and the cities that we choose to build. Looking back at São Paulo's map, we see that the wealthiest and more developed areas are also where fewer black people live. It's a segregated city that reflects the continuation of a long history of racial segregation. Many urban planning policies reinforce this structure by placing the white people in the best areas and displacing the black poor to the city's outskirts. The state uses narratives to legitimize these forced removals and housing rights violations. Recently, the state has displaced more than 200 poor families, mostly black families, from this well-developed area in the city, claiming that they were unsafe. Like the monuments, non-white territories are assessed 
using the dominant logic based on the narrative of subalternity that justified the state violent and segregationist approach. What would happen to these territories if, instead, they were assessed using narratives showing their potential? Philip's observation highlights how urban planning is not inherently inclusive, especially when those engaged in planning as a state-directed activity are also members of the dominant culture. They are less likely to recognize and question dominant norms and practices. On the contrary, and as the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie points out, while stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. When stories are taken seriously in planning, they can be a catalyst for change. Use storytelling as a co-creation tool can be one way through which planning accounts for stories of diverse urban stakeholders, challenging dominant thinking and practices. Storytelling can be a powerful tool to improve planning practice when engaging users as co-creators of their desired future and planning solutions. Storytelling as a co-creation tool can be used in different ways throughout the planning cycle. To enhance urban learning, for stakeholder engagement as bonding strategy, and to influence policy and agenda setting. Storytelling can also be used by different stakeholders, communities, and citizens to work towards achieving a commonly agreeable future. Through storytelling, actors can learn from each other, share values and experiences, and modes of doing inspire collective action, and bring awareness about gender experiences. But for Professor Van Hoost, storytelling as a tool for urban planning is not just about reconstructing stories. It is also about constructing stories and developing a community's narrative. There are various methods and techniques to bring people's stories to the planning practice, allowing safe and creative spaces for unheard stories to be visible. This can be done through, for instance, go-along interviews, walking in the city, drafting collective manifestos, or drawing visual narratives. These techniques might not hold against the very powerful forces that dominate planning decisions. Yet, when deployed tactically, it could expose how non-inclusive planning can be, thus warranting corrective measures. So, to summarize, we have discussed in this video that stories can provide a rich understanding of the urban conditions, but also stories can be used to impose dominant agendas. We have also discussed that storytelling as a co-creation tool can contribute to an inclusive planning practice if attention is paid to missing sideline stories. This means that planners should be attentive to how power shapes stories and recognize the values involved in the use of certain narratives. Planner should also be reflective on the impact of dominant stories and how and why they are used. Planners have an important role in recognizing and incorporating the voices of minority and marginalized groups. So they should always ask for more than a single story. And finally, planners should relate storytelling processes with making concrete plans and formal decision-making process. Overall, for storytelling to be a powerful planning tool, it requires critical reflection from planners. So I hope that after watching this video, you will reflect more closely about the stories you tell that represent urban life and are represented in urban planning.